Okay, welcome back. In the last video, you saw how we sent the player's position and input across the network. In this video, we're going to take a look at how we receive that and we update the remotely connected player's prefabs in the different clients' games. So to do that, we're going to dive into our network remote player prefab. You can see here that this is the one that was relatively simple. We only have a player network remote sync script here. And let's just dive into the code and see what's going on here. The first thing you can see is we have this remote player network data object. Now, going back to one of our previous videos, you saw that this contains the match ID, and it also has a reference to the iUser presence of the user that this game object represents. So for example, if I've connected to a game and my friend is connected, I'm gonna get a player prefab instantiated as soon as he connects. We're gonna spawn a player prefab in my game that represents his player and what his player is doing on his particular version of the game. And that reference is held here. The next thing is we are defining a lerp time, which is in seconds again, we're saying the speed in seconds in which to smoothly interpolate the player's actual position when receiving their corrected data. So before in the previous video, you saw that every sort of fifth of a second, we were sending across the player's velocity and their position, the most up-to-date version of it. This is when we receive that, depending on how far out we are, we're going to have to interpolate the player's position to make sure that it's in the correct place and going at the correct speed. So this is how fast we go from the potentially incorrect position to the actual latest correct position. And in this instance, again, we're going with a fifth of a second here. Next up, we have some references to the game manager and some of the other components within this player object. We also have a lerp timer, which is simply using the same pattern as we did previously for the state sync timer. We then have some variables for the lerp from and lerp to position. And we also have a Boolean that says whether or not we should be lerping this position or not. Okay, I'm gonna quickly gloss over this here. We're simply getting access to some of the components in this prefab. And then here you can see we are adding an event handler for when the socket receives some match state. And that's just the on received match state function here. Let's dive past some of this late update. This is to do with the interpolation. We can quickly just go over this. This is whenever the game object is destroyed, we're basically just removing that on receive match state handler. There's nothing special there. And the one we're interested in is this on received match state function. Now here we're saying if the match state .user presence .session ID does not equal the user session ID that we have stored in our network data, and that network data, remember, is this object up here. So if the user sending this, uh, if this game object doesn't belong to them in this client, then we're not interested. We, we don't need to do anything. It's not for this particular prefab to deal with. So we're just going to discard that and we're going to carry on. We're just going to return from this function entirely. However, if this prefab is supposed to be representing the user that sent this message, then we want to deal with this. So we're going to say switch on the match state opcode, and we're going to do different things depending on what we received. So if we received a velocity and position, then we're going to call this update velocity and position from state function here, and we're going to give it the state byte array. If it was an input opcode, then we're going to set the inputs from that state. Again, we're passing in the byte array there. And if it's the died opcode, then the only thing we're going to do here is we're going to call the play death animation. So let's dive into a couple of these functions. Let's go into the update velocity and position from state. So you can see the first thing we do here is we get the state dictionary. I've got a function here that basically takes the byte array and turns it back into a string string dictionary. We're then going to get the player's rigid body and we're going to assign the velocity of it to whatever value came back from this state. So again, we're looking at this velocity.x and velocity.y and we're passing those values through as floats and we're just going to assign that to a new vector too. And then again, like I say, we're passing that in directly to the player's rigid body. So whatever their current velocity is, that's going to get completely overwritten by what's just come through from the network. So for example, if on this particular client, the player was moving at a speed of three on the X axis, but actually the real velocity has just come through over the network and said, by the way, I'm no longer moving on the X axis at all. 
we're going to update their velocity to match exactly that. Similarly, for the position, we're going to create a new vector 3, depending on what the position.x and position.y comes through as. We're just going to use 0 here because it's a 2D game, so we're not using the z-axis at all. And then we're going to say, let's begin lerping to the corrected position. So we're going to say, lerp from position is their current position. The lerp to position is this position here that we've just received from the network. We're going to reset our lerp timer, and we're going to set the lerp position boolean to true to let this script know that we need to start lerping their position now. Now, if you're not familiar with what the term lerping means, I've said it quite a few times in this video and realized I haven't explained it yet. It's a term that is short for linear interpolation, and it basically defines how we go from one state to another over a particular period of time. So let's just scroll back up to the top of this script here, and you can see that we set our lerp time to a fifth of a second. So let's come back down here. What we're saying is let's go from where the player currently is to where the player should be in a fifth of a second. And let's go up to the late update function here. And you can see here, if we're not trying to interpolate this player's position, then we're just simply gonna return out of this function. However, if we are, we're gonna set their position in the transform, so the player position dot transform. We're gonna set it to a lerped value, so a linearly interpolated value between where they were where they want to be and depending on how far through that lerp timer we currently are. So lerp timer divided by lerp time. Again, I'm not going to dive into the details of how that particular function works, but just know that we're taking their new updated position and we're going to smoothly move them over a fifth of a second from where they were to where they actually should be in the game. Let's come back down to our on receive match state here and let's now look at the input function. So set input from state. Let's quickly dive into that. Again, we've got this state dictionary that we're just receiving from our helper function. And then we're going to our player movement controller and we're just setting those inputs directly on that component. So we're gonna get a float value for their horizontal input. We're gonna get a Boolean value for whether or not they're jumping. Again, a Boolean value for whether or not they're holding the jump button. And we're also going to get a Boolean value for whether or not they're attacking. And if that is true, then we're going to say to the player's weapon controller component, hey, it's time you need to attack. So this is actually replicating exactly how a local player controls its input by calling these set functions on the player movement controller. If we actually dive back into the fish game here and have a look at our network local player, you can see that our input controller here it does exactly the same thing, except it gets it from the input raw axes and the buttons, and then it calls the movement controllers set functions where appropriate. And if the attack button is held down, it calls the weapon controllers attack. We're literally replicating that in our player remote sync, but all we're doing is rather than calling the input.getAxis, we're getting that value directly from whatever's coming back over the network. And just while we're talking about this separation between the player's input and the actual movement, it's really handy to do it like that because it means that we could actually set up a brand new scene. You can see here I've got a local test scene. And inside this local test scene, I've got an offline local player prefab. Now this offline local player prefab has an input controller component, health controller component, and a camera controller component. It has no knowledge of any networking whatsoever. And I can simply press play and now I have access to a player that I can move around and test with zero network connectivity at all. So it's really handy to separate out your components in this way. It just means that you can be a lot more flexible about how you test your game. And with that being said, that's it for this video. In the next one, we're going to look at how we handled the player's death and announcing the round winner. So I'll see you there.